Welcome everyone. It's so terrific to see you all here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I'm Stacey Mitchell. I'm the co-director of ILSR, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. More than a decade ago, I helped launch an initiative here at ILSR focused on independent business. Um, we were and continue to be deeply concerned about the sharp decline in small independent businesses that we've seen across virtually every sector of the economy. Back at that time, there were very few political leaders on either side of the aisle who had much concern about this trend. The widespread assumption at that time was that small business didn't matter much, uh, the bigger corporations were better, more efficient, more productive, and so on. Today, we know that economic concentration and the losses that we've seen both for working people and for small businesses have had devastating effects on communities that the decline of small business and the growing concentration across our economy is really driving racial and economic inequality and ultimately undermining our democracy. And we know that the primary driver of this trend is concentrated corporate power, whether it's the power that these corporations wield in the market or the political power that they have to rig government policy in their own favor and to undermine their smaller competitors. Today, we're obviously at a very critical um, juncture in our country's history. And fortunately, small business is beginning to be more at the forefront of public discourse. We have a growing anti-monopoly movement and many progressive leaders are beginning to see small business as a central part of how we create an equitable economy and a vibrant democracy where all people can thrive. Today, we have just an incredible lineup of speakers to explore these issues. Um, and I'm just really excited about this conversation. Um, let me give you a quick overview of our run of show. Um, and I'm gonna briefly introduce our speakers and then we'll get going. So um, our keynote today is Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. Um, she's serving her third term in Congress representing Washington's seventh di district, which encompasses most of Seattle and its surrounding areas. She's the first South Asian American woman elected to the US House. She's a member of the House Judiciary Committee and she also serves as the vice chair of its subcommittee on antitrust where she's done really terrific um, work as part of the big tech investigation, looking at the impact of big tech and concentrated power, uh, particularly lifting up small businesses. Uh, after a, a, a conversation and remarks from the Congresswoman, we'll then turn to uh, Tim Wu, who is an official in the Biden White House uh, with responsibility for technology and competition policy. Tim is a legal scholar at Columbia University and uh, has authored several books, um, including a really terrific book called The Curse of Bigness. Um, he is a previously a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. And then following our conversation with Tim, the second half of the uh, of the today's event will be a really incredible uh, panel of speakers moderated by my, my colleague, uh, Katie Milani. Um, that panel includes Shonda Causer, who's the co-executive director of Main Street Alliance, national membership organization of small businesses, working to shift the economic narrative and win policy reform for small business owners, employees, and communities. We also have Brandy Collins Dexter, who's a visiting fellow at Harvard Kennedy School Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy, where she researches and writes on issues that are core to Black participation and democracy in the US economy. And we have Assembly Member Ron Kim, who represents the 40th District in the New York State Assembly. He is currently serving his fifth term in elected office. Um, you may have noticed he made national headlines uh, about a year ago when he blew the whistle on then Governor Cuomo's suppression of crucial nursing home data. He's also championed a number of legislative issues crucial to small business and was really uh, a key leader in the successful fight to block Amazon uh, from getting subsidies and bringing its HQ2 to New York City. So a few final things, I wanna give a big shout out to Jess Del Fiaco, ILSR's amazing communications manager who made all of this happen. Jess is also the host of our popular podcast, uh, Building Local Power. And a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Um, if you have a question, please submit it in the Q&A function. Um, you can submit questions anytime and we'll try to work those into the discussion, particularly the panel discussion. Um, also, this event is being recorded and we'll share the recording to uh, everyone who registered. And so with that, let's get started. I'd like to wel welcome uh, Congresswoman uh, Jayapal. It's so nice to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Stacy. it's so wonderful to be with you. And I am grateful to ILSR for all of your fantastic work and 
uh, for really elevating the issues of small business. Um, and of course, uh, my involvement with small business goes back to when we worked with Main Street Alliance around raising the minimum wage to 15 here in Seattle. Um, became the first major city to do that. And I think uh, small business was such an important part of that fight and really the framing of what it means to have healthy communities and the role that small businesses play in that, uh, in that landscape. Well, that's terrific. I, you know, you uh, have really been you know, central, you know, small businesses are at this really, you know, precarious moment right now. I mean, we've not only seen this 40 year decline where their role in the economy has been cut in half, um, but very precarious moment, both with concentrated power, with the effects of the pandemic and the way that that's magnified concentrated power and really a whole host of policy issues. You know, you've been really instrumental on, on some of the, the work in Congress around trying to, to restore antitrust law, I, I was very aware of the, the important role that you played in COVID relief around small business. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why progressives should even care about small business. I don't think small business generally has been on the progressive radar as like a central part of, of what we need. And why should progressives even care? Well, I mean, very simply put, progressives care about uh, local communities doing well. And the way that local communities do well is to have a thriving small business economy. I mean, that is so central to how we think about um, healthy and vibrant communities. Every community across the country has small businesses and people are very connected to their small businesses. And one of the things that we found going all the way back to 10 years ago on the minimum wage fight is that our small businesses often are very high road employers. They are very connected with the people who work in those small businesses and they wanna do right by them. And so a lot of progressive policies are at the forefront of the wish list for many small businesses. So I think we've come a long way in terms of uh, you know, really educating progressives about how small businesses are a key ally in our fight for justice um, and equity and that efforts to support small businesses aren't just limited to progressives, they're a concern for everyone on the political spectrum. And I think that is why we see a lot of bipartisan support. For, for me, you know, I told you about my background with really engaging with small businesses during the fight for 15, but the two issues that I have been very actively involved in around COVID relief and antitrust as the vice chair of the antitrust subcommittee really have that thread again in the middle of uh, small business. My district, the seventh district of Washington, which is the Seattle and surrounding areas, as you said, was hit first and very hard by the pandemic. And I think people around the world know Seattle as the home of you know, big corporations like Starbucks and Microsoft and Amazon, but it is so much more. It is the smaller independent coffee shops, the restaurants, the bookstores. In fact, we have one of the highest concentrations of independent booksellers in the country. And so we found out very quickly what the effects of COVID were on our local community and our small businesses. And it pushed me into finding how other countries in the world dealt with this kind of crisis situation. And in my research, I found that countries like Germany after the last recession put in place a program that allowed small businesses, medium-sized businesses to get assistance in circumstances where you reach certain thresholds, economic distress, unemployment, health uh, crises, those kinds of things. There were automatic stabilizers that kicked in. And instead of doing the assistance through a big bank that could leave people out, the model was for those businesses to go directly to the government. And so I worked with uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, economist, Joseph Stieglitz. I worked with Mark Zandi um, from Moody's. I worked with economists all over the spectrum and with small businesses and coalitions to put together a bill called the Paycheck Recovery Act, which would have uh, allowed all small businesses to not have to go through a third party of a big bank, which was how the Paycheck Protection Act was initially structured, and uh, to be able to go directly to the IRS with their tax filings and be able to get assistance that is proportional to their loss of um, income, their loss of, of sales or activity. And that that 
activity would determine how long the uh, the the um, assistance would go for, and it would go to fund things like rent and electricity charges and all the things that had to keep continuing, even as a small business had to shut down during COVID. So that I think would have been a far more effective way. It wouldn't also would not have kicked people off of healthcare. It would have allowed uh, small businesses to keep employees on their payroll and not deal with the problems of not having the workforce that we needed. And frankly, it would have been far more efficient at delivering relief to, uh, to our small businesses and much, much quicker. So that was one piece that I am still working on, actually, I'm gonna reintroduce it. And now that we've seen some of the problems with the delivery mechanisms for getting loans out to small businesses, I think we have a chance to make the legislation even stronger. Um, and people are realizing, yeah, this is what we should have done because it would have kept, it would have scaled the assistance. So if you have a wave of COVID, you could have uh, had more assistance when the wave is particularly bad or the surge in the virus is bad. And then as it goes down, you would have had less assistance, but you would have stayed in business the whole time. And that's what I heard from small businesses over and over again. So I think we have to do better to grant federal relief to small businesses who are devastated by the pandemic. On antitrust, if I can just say for a minute there, you know, I think when I came into the Judiciary Committee and the Antitrust Subcommittee, and when we started our investigation a couple of years ago, which was a 16 month investigation into uh, market concentration and monopoly power of the four big tech firms. I, you know, I don't know that I knew that much about exactly how that worked, but over 16 months, we heard from so many small businesses, some in great confidence because they were very afraid of what would happen to them if they spoke out and how they uh, could have the power that big tech firms wield over them, demote them to maybe not being on the first page when you do a search, uh, you know, a search engine, or if you're on Amazon, not getting the preferred customer slot. Um, and so some of it was not public. Some of it was done confidentially, uh, but we had uh, over, 120,000 documents that we got. We had uh, dozens of hearings and briefings and interviews with small businesses and some medium-sized businesses and even some big businesses about the practices of big tech and the ways in which market concentration and monopoly power have really contributed to driving small businesses out or setting the rules in such a way that you simply cannot compete. You can never compete. And uh, that led to a package of bills that we introduced in the Judiciary Committee, a bipartisan antitrust package that addresses these anti-competitive habits. And there are five bills that are focused on unique issues presented by these big tech companies. My bill is HR 3825, the Ending Platform Monopolies Act, which essentially protects the interests of small businesses that sell their products on digital platforms by eliminating the ability of those dominant platforms to leverage their control over multiple lines of business and self-preference their own business lines. This is something we heard over and over again about from small business owners who saw companies like Amazon suppress their listings by placing them at the bottom of the seller queue and simultaneously elevating their own competing products. And so uh, my bill addresses that conduct and it prohibits digital platforms from selling their own products on their websites. All of these bills, including mine, have bipartisan support, not just in Congress, but from small business owners from all backgrounds. I think these bills really transcend politics and they hit at the heart of what ILSR is, is about, what America is about. And that's free markets, small business ability to grow, and most importantly, better choices for Americans. It's been great to see, you know, the movement on monopoly power and the big tech bills. You know, there's an important vote in the Senate on one of those bills uh, just last week. 
Um, we've been thrilled to see your breakup bill, which is you know, really gets at the structural the inherent conflicts of interest that you just outlined that are deeply problematic. You know, and we hear from the, many of the small business owners we talk to that that bill is really you know an essential piece of of solving this problem. You know, for a long time, you know, big business has really the big business lobby, the Chamber of Commerce has like gotten to own like what's you know what small business needs, and you know, really and also own our political process to sort of drive their to drive their agenda. Can I mean, you talk a little bit about you know how you see um, uh, addressing small business issues and 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 engaging with small business as a base and as part of um, you know, sort of part of this uh, anti-monopoly agenda. You know how that might uh, be helpful in terms of 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 you know getting reducing corporate power you know not only in the economy but in our political system. Yeah, it's a really really important piece of the work we have to do, and frankly, it's going to be a very important piece of whether we're successful or not. And um, you know, and that is really uh, my call to action, if you will, to small businesses that are on this call, because you've already seen the amount of money that's being poured into lobbying Congress, but also lobbying the public, the you know, multi-minute ads on mainstream television, on every cable station about these big tech companies and why uh, our package of bills is not gonna be helpful. Um, a lot of sort of framing of the conversation as if the big tech companies are the savior for small businesses when in fact we know that um, our experience shows that they self-preference themselves and they act uh, competitively and actually drive a lot of small business out. And they have so much concentration of power, market power, that they can set, you know, I said during the hearing that it's sort of like being the um, referee of a game, making all the rules, calling all the plays and playing on the team. Um, and it's, it's like that. And so it's just a very unfair set of advantages. And what we really need, I think, if we're going to change the political landscape, is to have a real alliance with small businesses to help tell the stories of what small businesses are experiencing and to um, have small businesses be the ones reaching out to members of Congress to say, I support this package of bills. I support the ability for small businesses to have a competitive landscape to, to uh, operate our small businesses. And so I think that um, is very, very important. And I think Democrats have increasingly been uh, concerned about the pervasiveness of corporate power. And it's a message that resonates across party lines and can really help Democrats build support. When we looked at the political map on this issue, it is very much in favor of uh, exactly what we're talking about, you know, taking on big monopolies and uh, breaking them up and allowing small businesses to compete and also recognizing the monopsony power that is created with concentration of market power, right? What happens to workers when they don't have choices about where to go? Wages go down, benefits uh, go down. It's really, uh, it has multiple effects across the economy. The president has been, uh, and I know you're going to have Tim Wu on um, after me, uh, the president has been really very strong on lifting up competition and the role of um, monopolies in income inequity, racial inequity, a number of different pieces in all parts of our country, in rural America, with meatpacking and agriculture and the food supply, um, but also across the board. And so uh, I think that's a very good thing. He's got a lot of experts like, like Tim Wu and Lena Khan uh, at the FTC and others. Uh, Bharath Ramamurthy is also in the White House. And I think, uh, you know, they really understand this issue of concentration of, of corporate power. So I think we can improve our uh, support as Democrats for small businesses by understanding how these issues also intersect with dozens of other legislative priorities. So, you know, as the political makeup of small business advocates has grown, I hope that we will be able to engage directly with you to tell your stories and to also get your help in moving these sensible bipartisan measures like this bipartisan antitrust package. But also there's other issues that I hear from my small businesses all the time about. One of the big ones is healthcare. And I'm just gonna put in a plug for my bill, uh, HR 1976, the Medicare for All Act of 2021. 
which would add benefits to Medicare and expand Medicare and guarantee coverage to all Americans. Just think about how important health coverage is if a company, if a small business wants to be able to provide their employees with health insurance and doesn't wanna to have to try and navigate it on their own. And so that's why we've seen so much support from small businesses across the country to support something like Medicare for All because it gives employers a lot more freedom to keep wages in line with rising costs and just frees them up you know, to devote their energy to innovation and production instead of endless paperwork and phone calls with insurers. And even if they have insurance, uh, so many small business employers have told me about how they still have to fund GoFundMe campaigns for their employees because their employees are simply not getting the kind of healthcare that they need. So I think you know we have a real opportunity to use the bipartisan momentum to prevent dominant com companies from maintaining market power and using their extensive resources to stifle independent and small competitors from entering the market, and also to think about our communities in a holistic way. And I think that's what small businesses do particularly well. That's great. And, and I've, I've been so uh, heartened to see the focus, uh, as I said, on, on concentrated power and the ways in which you're not only in tech, but across the economy, I mean, even Visa and MasterCard's ability to levy these huge fees on local businesses. You know, it's, it seems so important, I think, partly because what we, you know, what I heard a lot from small business owners who say, you know, yes, we want to pay more. We want to be good stewards of our communities. We support these kinds of higher standards, but it can sometimes be really tough when we're asked to do that. And meanwhile, we've got corporate landlords and big banks who are hiking fees. We've got other monopolists who are blocking, you know, that we need progressives to fight for us uh, mm -hmm. in order to be able to be the kinds of community stewards um, that, that we're capable of being. I know we just have a couple of minutes left with you, but I, I, I do want to get to one important final question, which is small business has a, a particular significance in communities of color and, and immigrant communities. And I, and I was, you know, I'm just interested to hear your reflections on that and, you know, how you, you think policymakers uh, can be thinking about small business development as a strategy for building both economic and political power in black and brown communities. Yeah, this is so important um, because I think we see how small and minority and women-owned businesses are still suffering. And when businesses fail, communities fail. And I think you saw this in the first iteration of the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Act, which uh, used big banks to deliver relief. And so what happened? If you didn't have a relationship with a big bank and a lot of small businesses didn't, and they don't have armies of lawyers and and accountants to process applications and things like that. The money was gone. The first tranche of money was gone before it ever reached small businesses. It was really taken up by larger businesses that had relationships with those big banks. And my view is that you know we shouldn't rely on big banks to get money out to small businesses and, and minority communities. That's just never been, uh, <laughs> big banks have never really been good at doing that. And we should have learned that lesson. And so I think, um, that is what we saw with our minority owned businesses. They just didn't get the assistance they needed. Now, later we made some changes thanks to Nydia Velasquez, the chairwoman of the Small Business Committee, did make some changes that allowed for um, credit unions and uh, local um, development, uh, you know, community development banks to be able to be the stewards of some of those funds. But the reality is, I just talked to my local coffee shop that I go to every, every Sunday when I'm here at home. And she said, you know what, Congresswoman, I didn't even apply. It was just too much. And this is a thriving small business right near my home. And I said, listen, you got to call me next time because we will walk you through it. But, you know, she basically said, it's, it's just too much. It's too hard. And when I told her about the Paycheck Recovery Act and how you would essentially use your same tax forms that you submit and just do an attestation of what's happened and then the money would flow and it could always be adjusted at the end of the year with your next set of taxes if your revenue were to go up she was like why can't we have something like that and so that's what we need for minority businesses and women-owned businesses um, to be able to prioritize those procedural pieces that would uh, you know, that, that prevent small businesses and minority owned businesses from getting uh, uh, their fair share. And I think we also have to be much more intentional about how we target 
minority businesses in particular. And we need to use trusted advocates and messengers to, um, to connect with those communities. And, you know, and, and just ultimately prioritize economic dignity for, for everyone. So I think those are some of the things we've learned. I just fear that we, uh, it takes us a long time to change the way things are done. And that's why we need your advocacy and the Progressive Caucus, our hundred members are very, very committed to doing everything we can to strengthen our small businesses across the country. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Jayapal. It's just lovely to have you here. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for all the work that you are doing. Really appreciate that. Great, take care. Um, and let's uh, now transition to our second segment, uh, our second keynote speaker, um, uh, Tim Wu. Welcome. So nice to see you. Likewise, likewise. Thank you for having me. Um, just to briefly reintroduce you, um, Tim is a White House advisor focused on competition uh, policy issues. Um, and I guess I wanna just start you know, by saying, you know, just sort of going back to something I raised at the be beginning of this, which is that we've seen this you know, really pretty sharp decline across most sectors of the economy over the last 40 years in, in, in small businesses. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, why America has become so much less hospitable to local businesses uh, and what's at stake if we, we continue down this path? Yeah, sure, thank you. And uh, thanks everyone, it's great to, I, I really appreciate a chance to, to address this, this audience. Uh, I feel like I have small business in my blood. I started a hot dog business as a teenager. My brother uh, ran a software uh, business and I've always just had this uh, kind of admiration for the courage, uh, the resiliency, the, the, the kind of virtues that uh, lead people to, to take the risk on, on running their own business or inheriting or, or just uh, you know, deciding to, 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 take this, uh, to take this route in life. Um, so I just want to start with that. Uh, you know, actually, it's been said before, worth saying again, uh, when you go to the founding, the United States uh, was always uh, built on the back of, of regional economies, small business. And I, I want to emphasize that that has been a key, um, and we really believe this, to the nation's democratic soul, strength of its character. Um, you know, you'll sometimes hear about Louis Brandeis, uh, uh, famous as a Supreme Court justice, but he was also an anti-monopoly crusader, um, also came from a long line of small business uh, men, as small business small businessmen back then. And he would always speak about the link between a nation of small producers and the kind of virtue and character of, of, of the country. And you know, it's virtues like risk-taking, resilience, responsibility, uh, innovation, uh, this. You, you have to have these uh, to, to smart a business and to keep start a small business and to keep running it. And I think it's a big part of what has made this uh, country historically the land of opportunity. Uh, the question is what's happened and uh, you know where are we? I think right now we're really going through an experience where we can see very vividly how fragile this concentrated economic system we built has been and how poorly it is working for the whole country. Uh, our country has become too centralized. It's too national in its character in terms of where businesses are located, too centered on consumption as opposed to production. Too, much of, too many of the returns go to too few people who often live very far away from the communities they serve. And so I think what's happening right now is we're relearning the virtues and the merits of a mixed economy that is the truer American tradition of small and medium businesses, market structures where they can all survive and prosper, uh, what the president often calls an economy that works for everyone. Uh, you know, you only have to look around and, and see how, how much uh, we're struggling with the fragility of our supply chains and, you know, and, uh, and, and the extraction of rents by some of the entities we already mentioned, whether it was credit card companies, whether it was healthcare, uh, to see that there's something uh, pervasively wrong here. Uh, the question is what's changed and how can we return the ship? Um, the problem, the main problem is, is that about 40 years ago, we began to subscribe to a set of microeconomic principles that were fundamentally focused on prices and profits. And we're not interested in the health of the economy from a more macro perspective. We're not interested in ensuring a healthy mixture of, of businesses, small, medium, large. But as I said, we're very focused on narrow economic uh, metrics. 
And that's led to uh, at least three problems uh, that I wanna highlight. Uh, one is very well known, I think. We've, we've all seen uh, so many industries uh, consolidate into just a big three or a big four, you know, Visa, MasterCard, uh, mobile plans, uh, airlines, uh, uh, parts of the insurance industry. And that, that's a you know, traditional problem that I think extracts a lot from the economy, um, market power, power among sellers. But I also want to highlight a problem that maybe many of this, uh, people experience firsthand, which is what we call the rise of a middleman economy, uh, which has really accelerated over the last decade. And that's where so many industries have seen the rise of a highly concentrated middle layer, uh, You know, whether that's an online uh, selling platform or uh, just a few online selling platforms, whether that's meat processing, where you have just a, a few uh, companies that uh, uh, process almost all the beef in the United States, uh, whether that's uh, the credit card situation, whatever it is, also banking, you just have a sort of middle layer that's extracting uh, a great amount of the revenue for itself. And it leads to a different problem than, you know, we might be familiar with when you think about monopoly, which is, you know, just high prices. It leads to this problem where the, the middle layer, the middlemen have pro power over their suppliers and are able to squeeze their suppliers and also often able to squeeze their employees. And it, it's a problem that I think is uh, kind of a new problem for the economy uh, and one that we, we need to face in, in, and we need to face uh, directly. Third thing I wanna sense, say is, uh, and I'm sorry for going on such length, but there is a real sense that whatever it is that the, the sense of opportunity that has been sort of the, the American brand has, has uh, diminished and you know, there's statistics a little depressing that, uh, that kind of confirm this. Uh, in over 75% of US industries, large companies control more of business than they did 20 years ago. Um, you know, the mergers, uh, we've since, since the mid eighties, uh, the number of annual mergers is, has, has skyrocketed. Um, in 85 was about 2000 a year. Now it's more than 15,000 a year. And I think this year it will be historic levels. And that's, uh, you know, the process of consolidation, large companies buying up smaller ones. And finally, over the last 20 years, the share of total business going to small firms has fallen by nearly a fifth. So these are real challenges that I, I would just wanna assure you that the administration, the White House is very focused on. And we see it not just in terms uh, of the economy, but in terms of, of uh, the democratic soul of this nation. Um, you know, freedom and opportunity are, are, are not trivial things in, in when it comes to describing what a democracy is all about. And we need to fight to restore that, to, to restore the sense that, you know, this is a country where you do have the freedom to take your shot, where you do have the opportunity, the economic opportunity to strike out on your own or, uh, uh, and, and uh, really try and, and make something. And I think that is, we see as a real key to restoring the character of this nation that we love. So back in July, I think it was, um, President Biden issued this executive order that is designed to focus on, on competition and restoring competition. It is a big sprawling document with a lot of provisions. Can you, uh, <laughs> can you give us an overview of like what it does? Like, does this have real, you know, can this have real impact? And in maybe some of the components that are, are most relevant to independent businesses. You know, I think just to answer that straight up, I think it already has had a real impact and will continue to have a lot more. Um, just uh, today, for example, the uh, director of the CFPB, uh, which regulates uh, financial institutions, um, uh, Rohit Chopra, uh, announced a new war uh, he, on, uh, on junk fees being charged by banks. He wants to save uh, bank consumers. Uh, I think his target is $36 billion. Um, and, you know, he announced that at the Competition Council, and uh, uh, which I'll describe in a minute. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that's just an example of the kind of things that I think the executive order is trying to do. So let, let me uh, back up and, and describe what it was. So on July 9th, the, the president signed an executive order on competition. It is uh, something of a sprawling document. There's 72 directives. But its goals should be understood um, in light of what I was saying earlier, it's a historic effort to try to turn this giant steamship called economic policy and point it in a different direction. You know, in his speech launching it, uh, the, the president spoke about uh, the Roosevelt's, both Theodore and, and FDR, 
Roosevelt's um, and, and their uh, vision, uh, you know, of an economy that was democratic in nature and, and fundamentally uh, uh, geared toward, towards opportunity and, and deconcentration and, and, and a fair economy for small and medium-sized business. And that's where we want to turn uh, back to. Um, so the, uh, the executive order created the Competition Council, uh, which is uh, the heads of 17 agencies who are tasked with uh, both in specific and general ways, trying to improve uh, competition in the economy, uh, promote competition in the economy. And let me talk about some of what they're doing and some of what uh, they will do. Um, so at one level, uh, this is a reinvigoration of antitrust enforcement. And you've seen the president has appointed two strong enforcers, Lena Khan, Jonathan Cantor, um, you know, to be in the, at the front line of, of, of enforcement. And, you know, we try not to talk about uh, current cases, but there's a, a number of challenges out there to mergers that are anti-competitive in their views. And um, uh, they've also already managed to block a few mergers. Uh, a big one was uh, the Justice Department uh, early this year blocked a merger uh, between uh, uh, two of the uh, three largest insurance brokers, which if it had uh, gone through would have raised insurance rates for businesses um, and uh, further increased costs for everyone. So I think that was a, a big uh, success. Um, some of the other things that, uh, you know, I'll spare you all the details, 72 directives is a lot, but, um, you know, take another example, the order commit has committed um, uh, the administration and its agencies to uh, protecting the right to repair. Uh, I know for a lot of businesses, a lot of individuals, um, you know, paying dealer prices is, is a very expensive proposition. And we're doing everything we can uh, to try to uh, fight against repair monopolies and make it so either you can fix your own stuff or you can go to independent repair shops. Um, we've had some success um, with uh, companies, including uh, Apple and, and Microsoft announcing they're gonna change their policies and uh, make it easy to repair stuff. And we think that has a lot of, of, lot of legs. Um, you know, I, I can go on at, 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 at some detail, um, but I, I wanted uh, just to, to, to give, I don't want to get caught in the detail. I just want to give an impression uh, or give you the sense that um, the, the, uh, the whole of government and not just the antitrust agencies, though they're a big part of it, is trying and directed by the president to find ways to try and improve competition. And I want to also say the president is into this. Um, he uh, you know, came to the meeting of the Competition Council on, on Monday. Uh, he's repeatedly spoken about making, uh, turning the economy around, make it work for all Americans, and spoken of competition as the third uh, pillar. So there's a lot in there, uh, and I, I uh, uh, look forward to, to talking about that uh, at greater length. That's great. Well, we, um, I, I feel like I could ask you, uh, we could, we could spend the next half hour continuing to talk about this, um, but unfortunately we're out of time and, and need to move on to the next panel, but that was a really terrific overview um, and glad to hear that this work is going on. We um, have a rundown of some of the things that are in the executive order on our website that are, are particular, I think, highlights for, for some of the concerns that, that small businesses have um, and excited to see that work go forward and 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 um, you know and hopefully really have an impact on policy. Tim, thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. It was great. And uh, yeah, there's a lot in there. If I can just say in closing, just one thing I'll stress is the Defense Department. Um, uh, you know, I had a, a number of things probably should have gotten them, but the Defense Department, uh, for example, is 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 revamping its small business uh, procurement program. So there's just one example of something else that the executive order. Uh, has directed uh, the agencies to do. So thank you so much for having me on and uh, appreciate uh, hearing what comes next. That's great, thank you. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, uh, Katie Milani, who is ILSR's senior policy advocate to moderate our panel. Welcome, Katie. Hi everyone, uh, it's great to be here um, and what a great turnout for this event. And I just have to say, I was going to put a plug in for folks to 
you know, submit questions in the Q&A. And I have to say, we are getting a lot of wonderful, robust, interesting questions. So thank you for all the engagement from the participants. Um, so the Congresswoman and Tim Wu really set the stage for our panel discussion today. So I'd like to invite uh, Brandy Collins-Dexter, Chandra Chaser, and Assemblyman Tim, uh, Ron, Ron Kim to, um, to join me here for this discussion. You can turn your video on. And I think what, what we're gonna do for the next you know, 30, 30 minutes or so uh, for the remainder of the program is to hear, dig in a little deeper on what we're hearing on the ground from small businesses, some of the organizing that is, is already underway with small businesses to build, build a real base. Uh, uh, to put wind in the sails of some of the policies we'd like to see. Um, and we're also here from state and local level what is moving. And I'm also excited to hear from Brandy in particular to bring some historical context of the ways in which small and independent businesses have played such a critical role in movement building and in, uh, in putting you know, wind in the sail policies we'd like to see. So um, with no further ado, I'm gonna start our um, discussion here today uh, with, with um, you, uh, Chanda, um, specifically because you do at MSA hear from small businesses doing a lot of the organizing. And there's this commonly held uh, notion, story of what is hurt, hurting small business. And this is a take or a question that uh, Stacey earlier asked of the Congresswoman, but I'd like to hear your take of what you are hearing from small businesses, um, what is uh, really hurting them from being able to grow. And so how are we um, you know, challenging this notion that we've heard that uh, the, the right and conservatives and that you know, bigness is better? Um, what are you hearing on the ground, particularly when you're going door to door, meeting with small businesses and what are they telling you are the main factors uh, that are impeding them from growing and thriving? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, for the folks that we organize, we don't hear big, bigness is better. We don't hear those types of conversations. I, I would say personally, um, my grandmother ran a small business, my mom ran a small business. And the thing that really keeps um, us up and small business owners is thinking about tax fairness. Uh, at the end of the day, we were all paying and contributing to our uh, overall economy and, and corporations are making billions and paying zero. Um, we're also hearing about health care and the overall care economy. You know, um, I remember my mom having my little brother and then going right back to work. I don't even think that she took more than two weeks off. And it's because, you know, we need those infrastructures like paid leave and child care services for small businesses, not only for the owners, but for employees. Um, we also hear about uh, capital access. We want to make sure that everybody has a place to enter the market culture. So whether you've been formerly incarcerated, um, black, brown communities, um, those who are living outside of dominant culture should have an opportunity to enter. Um, and those traditional methods that the Congresswoman lifted up earlier oftentimes prevent those outside of dominant cultures and access to that type of cap capital to start a business. And then finally, is breaking up those monopolies. Anti-monopoly is the thing that we hear more and more. Um, and so those are the issues that we have from small businesses, Katie, and that's how we organize. No, that that is great. And, you know, I'd like to um, invite uh, Assemblymember Kim to chime in here. I think your district and, you know, covers lots of Queens in New York City. Um, you, you, your constituents, many of which are small business owners, uh, there's a robust small business community in your district um, and they are a big part of your base. And so I want to um, ask a similar question to you around the ground level politics. What is at stake for Queens and other small businesses across the country if we allow for this further con concentration, as, as Shonda just said, that this is an issue that she's hearing from Main Street Alliance members. How, um, what are you hearing from some of your constituents and what, what's really at stake? Well, thank you, Katie. Uh, so you're right, I rep the largest number of small businesses and mom and pops in the state. Um, and 11 years ago, when we went through uh, the Great Recession, my district was one of the only uh, neighborhoods that actually grew stronger economically. And studies have shown subsequently that one of the main reasons why my community uh, was resilient to such uh, economic downturns was because of our local commerce and small businesses. Uh, families who live and work in our communities recirculated money locally by either spending at each other's stores or toward care or lend money between local businesses. And that's how we got by. Uh, but in 11 years, our city and state ushered in mega projects 
filled with mega corporations and chain stores uh, that are making it impossible uh, for our small businesses in my community to survive. Um, you know, money is no longer flowing locally, uh, but every second money is getting extracted um, out of our community. And just recently, I sat down uh, for a long time with the local restaurant owner uh, who, who runs one of the oldest um, Korean American um, restaurant, you know, in New York City. And he's considering turning his uh, shop into a worker cooperative um, because it, the numbers no longer add up for him. And the between rent and the fines and lack of, um, as, as a previous um, speaker, Shanda mentioned, healthcare and all the costs that are that are tied to being a small business owner no longer makes sense. But when I talk to him about a cooperative movement that's happening in New York City, uh, he automatically gravitated toward it. So that's the climate that, um, that we're in right now. Um, and unless we figure out a solution to stop subsidizing the growth of these monopolies, we, you know, we're not even not even enforcing antitrust. We're actually subsidizing the growth of these of these mega corporations, um, and shift gear toward building local local economic resilience. We're only going to uh, see worse outcomes for years to come. Yeah. So what you're hearing is just validating what what Shonda's hearing across across the country. Um, so I'd like to just um, build off of some of the remarks that Tim Wu earlier was saying around democracy, and there's such a, a connection between corporate power, uh, economic power, corporate power, and uh, uh, demo our democratic processes. And to you, Brandy, I have a couple questions because you've dug in deeply. Sometimes deep research recently um, on the historical connection and the importance between small business and movements. Movements and the uh, political engagement is so key to a thriving democracy. And so I'd love for you to um, give us, you know, take a step back and look at this political, or sorry, sorry the historical context of small business and, and movements. And looking back to, I know you've done some research around civil rights and racial justice. And, and as part of that, can you also speak to what happens when small business isn't there? Like what, what happens when they're not in that space for power building? Um, so I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I mean, I think when it comes to um, the research and the activism, the, the personal is political. Uh, and so I want to I want to actually start with uh, my family story and this question of what do you think of when you hear small business owner who pops into your head? What does that bring up for people? Um, oftentimes, it's not necessarily black women who are more likely than white men to start um, their own businesses. It's oftentimes not. Um, working class people from like specific areas starting businesses as a means to um, fuel and support their community, not just um, themselves. And when I think of um, business owner and small business owner, I think of my great grandfather, um, Jacob C. Ledford. So in the post-Civil War era, my mom's family had accumulated about 200 plus acres of land in Tennessee. Um, and on that land, they built a school, a church, and they grew tobacco on that land. And they were really trying to live out the idea of what it meant as a Black family to actualize what today we would call the American dream. At the time, the American Tobacco Company owned 80% share of, of cigarette and chewing tobacco market and had a large amount in the region where my family owned land. The Southern farmers lashed out at those big companies, but they also lashed out at Black farmers like my family, destroying the farms and the crops, attempting to compensate the land. All of the sons, including my um, great grandfather, were forced to leave Tennessee and start over again, which he did in Chicago um, as a chauffeur in the early 1900s. And he learned everything about how to build a car from the ground up. And he wanted to own his own um, car shop. And so he went on to do that. And, and what that meant in the community in Chicago was not just that we had a 
car shop. It was also a place that became a source of mutual aid during the depression and ability to um, repurpose that business into a place where people could come and get food. Um, they created like makeshift bedrooms in there so that people could stay there as they were passing through. It was the opportunity for people to get jobs who um, maybe weren't able to get jobs anywhere else. And that is um, just a little bit of what the functionality that that business served in the community. Community. And this isn't a story that's in the past or um, a story that's unique to my family. This is a story of what small business owners are doing in America every day and have continued to do. This is present in the things that we've seen during COVID where a lot of black and Latino businesses um, reported actually changing the functionality of their businesses during COVID in order to serve the needs of the community. So a place that might've become like a fashion shop um, became a place where people could get food and other resources like that. Um, it's, it's so much, it's important for us to talk about um, anti-competition to talk about all the technicals, but I think it is also extremely important for us to talk about the fact that these businesses are lifeline, they're a life source, they're base of power for our community. So to speak finally to your question about civil rights, there is a long history um, during Jim Crow till now of black businesses and being the epicenter of organizing structure um, and organizing uh, agenda setting. It was the places where a socialist like A. Philip Randolph and a Republican like Milton P. Webster could come together and organize around labor rights and labor fights. Um, they've been places that have, you know, behind the scenes funded, um, you know, civil rights fights. Um, it's local black media, which has been able to tell the story of what's happening in different communities. Uh, and I think that like, when we talk about, um, you know, how to bring together black business, how to bring together business and progressives, like part of what we should acknowledge is one of that history is there. And part of what we've seen explicitly in the black community is that when people come together across ideology and when you see black businesses coming together with black workers, usually what happens is that we get progressive wins, like people get pushed further to what we would call today the left in terms of policies that get passed because it's about lifting the floor for everyone, not just, um, breaking through ceilings or building a sort of narrow lane for some people, but it's about community care. And so our ability to tell that story um, through the work that we're doing and the, and the work that ILSR do, is doing in, in Main Street Alliance, I think that continues to be important now more than ever. Yeah, I find that historical context to be so grounding and inspiring. It makes it seem possible. And this also leads me to the question I wanted to um, do one more round with, with the three of you um, before turning over to the Q&A, which is blowing up. I am impressed. So um, Shonda, for you, around this you know, uh, concentration antitrust, um, you know, we at ILSR um, hear from small business owners and in the Small Business Rising Coalition, from many of those partners, independent trade associations, independent local business groups, that their business owners are electrified by what the what Congress is doing, the Biden administration's appointments. Um, but the reality is, and we've talked about this, that monopoly and antitrust hasn't been in the public discourse in, in, in a long time. And when we, when we have a discussion around policy and antitrust policy, it's many small business owners, um, often small business owners aren't necessarily familiar. There's some skepticism, I think healthy skepticism that anything will actually will change and, you know, layer on top of that, that business owners are running a business. <laughs> and so, and that is more than a full-time job. So my question for you is particularly from your perch at Main Street Alliance is, um, as you think about organizing and building political pow power, what do we need in this moment? Um, what is the work that MSA, Main Street Alliance, sees ahead for the organizing and the political education around anti-monopoly? Yeah, I mean, thank you for that, that, that big, healthy uh, frame of the state of, of things, Katie. Um, I think I want to pick up on a couple of nuggets that you laid out. I think I heard you say, you know, small businesses are running businesses, so we're busy. And I often hear folks say, you know, how do we organize people that, you know, have this, these full jobs? And the average small business owner that we have at MSA employs less than 10 employees, you know, and so that's a lot of like day-to-day -day work. But I would say we're all busy, 
you know, working in the education space, parents are too busy for education. Um, when you're doing workers and union organizing, workers are too busy to think about union. And so I just move that aside. This is about democracy and re-engaging in our local economy and our local culture. So we have to organize around self-interest. And as you, you know, I, I laid out earlier, um, through self-interest, we uncover the right issues, um, just kind of taking a pen on anti-monopoly. Um, through that, we did a survey and 68% of the people who responded to the survey wanted to talk about monopoly and anti-monopoly with us. So we had a series of rounds of what we call an organizing from the industrial areas model of house meetings, basically gathering people together to talk about the issues. Um, in that conversation, we heard from Anne-Marie uh, Rose. Oh, my glasses keep falling down, I keep kind of pushing them back up. Anne-Marie Rose, who runs a stained glass business in Minnesota. Um, and what she talked about is that... <clears throat> sitting in this uh, house meeting style is that when she started out with a platform that is now meta, meta uh, she would pay and would get 4,000 engagements and 80% of them being new. Um, since the new analytics switch, she's still paying the same rate, but she gets four engagements and 2% of them are new. And then when you started to have these conversations, folks can say, wait, that's happening to me too. And for our small economies, especially for those um, BIPOC businesses in my community, I don't know how many hair businesses that shut down during COVID because of these changes in algorithms. Um, that just really takes a big picture is that this, this outside entity that's nowhere near this local economy is really deciding if you can eat at the end of the day, because that's what that means, right? If you go from 40,000 to 40. Jessica Peterson White, also in Minnesota, ran an independent business. Um, and through this conversation and her fight with Amazon that we also hear, she lifted up something really different. She said, you know, y'all, this is not just me selling books, but I have to educate my consumer about why it might make sense to pay 25% more for this book. Because if we don't have this, we're not gonna have any other bookstores in our um, in the neighborhood that she lives in Minnesota. So I think it's about the public education. And so we have to bring um, education leaders together. We have to bring union workers together and small business owners and entrepreneurs because we have to do this fight in solidarity. This is a fight um, for um, our local economy. And so I think I don't wanna make it so down because what's exciting about this time that we have been in this suspended animation is what I call it for the last two years. Um, is that we're coming out and saying like, wait, I, I want to walk down the street and, and go to that shop that's always been there. Uh, I want to have those restaurants in, in, our, in our town. So it's giving people an eye opener. And so now we need to go back to the days that were before. My grandmother grew up, you know, people talked about union songs, you sung the songs. And so that passed on to next generation. So we cut those off. And so we need to start singing those songs again, because it really contributes to like how we think about um, you know, each other and our, and our, uh, and our organized uh, around, uh, uh, lost by a uh, train of thought and, and organized around democracy, I'm sorry. But um, I'll pass it back to you, Katie. Oh, that's great, yes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm been, it's been fascinating to hear some of the, the real stories, hearing from how business owners are reacting. And also there's, once you get to the specifics on how these policies impact or how corporate power impacts individual businesses, it makes it so real and, and concrete, not just for other business owners, but for the public and for policymakers. I mean, once the small business voice gets in front of a policymaker, like actually this is how antitrust and corporate concentration is impacting me, it, it shifts the conversation. So yeah, that's, that's great and important work that you're leading. Um, so we have two, I have two more questions before moving to the Q&A. Um, the next one I want to ask you, Assembly Member, going back to, I mean, there's a lot of great stuff, um, policy and, and um, moving in New York and New York State. And so from your perspective on the local and at the state level, what are some of the key policy changes needed um, to enable independent and small business to, to thrive? Like what are states doing and particularly New York doing here? Yeah, well, first I want to Thank um, I, 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 ILSR, because for the last many years, I've been looking at um, some of your policy recommendations around cracking down some of these abusive and predatory uh, companies and intermediaries, for instance, uh, PBMs uh, is something that we've been focused on to help our local pharmacies. Um, but beyond that, I think we have a larger, we, we have a larger problem of how we've been uh, normalizing economic development uh, in our states. And we use that term to um, you know, give corporate um, 
billions and billions of dollars every year of, of tax breaks and and we compete in constant race to the bottom with other states to lure big companies in while using taxpayers money um, so i think we need to curtail this practice we have legislation to end corporate giveaways and, and engage in poaching uh, big businesses and engaging in um, a race to the bottom activity um, i'm also now currently looking at um, possible ways to uh, look uh, to crack down on private labeling and branding in big retailers um, like targets because like amazon what they're doing now is introducing their own uh, vertically integrated products that they're selling at cheaper prices destroying uh, any of the local competition uh, that can um, you know brought, that can bring some of the products to the shelves of these retailers. Um, you know, these are some band-aid short-term and long-term um, solutions to give our small businesses a shot uh, at competitive markets like in New York City. Um, but again, as long as we're spending in places like New York seven to eight billion dollars a year of tax breaks, tax breaks to subsidize the growth of mega monopolies and big companies uh, who, all, who in return donate millions and millions of dollars uh, to executive officers and governors and mayors to keep this game going, uh, we're going to have a continuous problem. Um, so little by little, we're inching toward breaking this cycle uh, to build economic resilience. That's great. Um, so, I, Brandy, I'd like you to close us out here um, with a couple comments around where do you see uh, opportunities for, for strategic campaigns, alignment and alliance between small business, labor, racial justice groups? You've, you, touch on, you touched on it a bit earlier when you gave us the historical context, but I'd like to bring it back to current, to today. Where, where are you seeing the alignment, the potential for alignment or it actually moving and happening? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's so many different opportunities that a lot of folks have brought up over the course of, um, you know, this meeting. There's there's so much work to be done around Amazon. Um, obviously, like Assembly Member um, Assemblyman Kim was uh, was a very vocal voice around pushing back against Amazon HQ and, and really like telling that story of. Uh, breaking through the myths of like big business equaling like big jobs and more opportunities for people in the community and really reshifting that and reframing that and talking about how small business owners are the ones that, that are bringing in um, you know, those jobs that have the storefronts um, that are, you know, so important to the retail industry and to sustainability of local communities. And so I think the work that Athena is doing, um, which I know the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and, and other folks, um, I believe Mainstream Alliance, um, other folks on this call are part of, I think are really crucial um, to like uplifting all of the challenges around Amazon and where we're going with Amazon and bringing small business owners into that conversation and into that story. Um, I think there's also a lot of work around, you know, Silicon Valley. Um, we know that, um, you know, Black women um, owned businesses have grown 300% in their inter internet age. They get 0.00006% of venture capital. Um, you know, sometimes I, I, I am, hesitant to really get into venture capital because I think there's so much there but certainly there's an opportunity for like challenging this idea that um you know regulation stifles innovation or you know all of these different myths that are often brought up to the hill in order to derail opportunities to expand competition to regulate um big tech and others uh so I think there's like a number of different possibilities from a narrative standpoint to an activism standpoint um to even again like creating those bases in the community, those education hubs, as Shonda talked about, where we can really like talk about monopoly power and all of these things to the community in an accessible way. Great. Um, wow, what a 
an incredible and rich discussion. And I, I, there's a lot of questions that came in through the q and I also see on the chat a lot of rich conversation. Um, so, and back and forth. I, I think we'll have time at least for one or two, but I wanna build off of, Brandy, you mentioned the Athena Coalition. I mentioned a few uh, moments ago, Small Business Rising. It's another coalition, uh, Small Business Rising Coalition of now uh, 30 independent business uh, um, organizations, Main Street Alliance is a member, um, and this, this coalition is really putting wind in the sail and putting the small business voice front and center of why reigning in corporate power is so key. It's been quite engaged on the big tech bills. The Athena Coalition is another coalition of now 50 plus uh, organizations. Uh, really, this campaign is targeting Amazon as one of the key uh, threats to our local communities and uh, economies from thriving. You know, it's a real inter intersectional campaign that's looking at Amazon's impacts, not just on small business, on workers and on communities, but also on the environment. And there's one question that came up um, in, in the chat around in the monopoly, the monopolized economy uh, impacts the environment. So how so this uh, issue is is important and very much in, intersects with a big uh, big business problem. How do you draw the line uh, with messaging and why? How do you in, integrate the messaging with all of these integrated impacts that corporate power has on our economies? Um, I just had one other note to that. I mean, it does seem like there's an opportunity there, right, to bring in different folks because we all, you know, we're multifaceted people. Uh, you know, organizers or activists or just citizens that care about improving our economy and our local communities. So I thought this environmental question was was um, interesting. And so I don't know if uh, who wants to take that up first on the panel. Um, I'll give a moment to see if anyone wants to respond to this question around the environment and corporate power. Can you just repeat the, I'm sorry, what about the environment? I'm sorry. That that monopolized, like big business has an impact. Corporate power has a big impact on our environment. And what, how how do we draw on that, that messaging or the impacts on the environment into reigning in corporate power and big business? Like, what are your thoughts generally on the environmental like Sustainability, like- Yeah, mean, yeah. Policies? Yeah, I, I mean, think I think that is the question, yeah. Yeah, I mean, over consumerism and all all, all the access products that we make, uh, through corporate concentrated power leads to more carbon emissions. There's there, there are scientific studies over and over that that uh, answers that question. And helping local uh, businesses upcycle products, recycle products, um, that's the kind of stuff that helps uh, create a local greener society. And I think I think at the underneath uh, for that question is is. Um, a, a, a society for 40 years that have done everything to reward over consumerism um, and over consumerism at the end of the day kills our planet. Um, and I think that's something, that's an uncomfortable discussion as uh, capitalist business people to have, but by focusing on small business solutions, we can find a balanced solution. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think it's, I think it's extremely important to have diversified messaging within this coalition, but also understand what it means to build in the different, you know, pre-existing um, spaces and work because everybody has an entry point into this, as you mentioned, mine was media and I was doing like media justice work and then learning that like 90% of media was owned by, you know, just six companies and what that meant about how our stories are told was like my entry point into this. Um, but I didn't, I didn't start here. So the question is like, when you go into the environmental justice movement, when you go into like the labor movement, like how, how is organizing to, um, you know, expand the reach of like to tie other people's issues back um, to this issue of monopoly power without necessarily asking them to like, you know, come over into this lane, but for them to be able to carry that forward and, and enter that into a number of different conversations where it might not otherwise come up, I think is extremely important to think about as we're looking towards the future of organizing. 
Yeah, I, I think I just will add just in terms of like how, how to organize. That was a big, big meaty question, Katie. Um, but like I would say that we work with people uh, based on self-interest in, in our communities. And oftentimes some folks will come up with like, we need to start thinking about safe routes to schools and safe routes in our communities. That also can connect to um, a climate because climate in itself is like, how do we solve racism? Um, you know, these are all kind of big complicated. So we have to take you know, little bites by bites um, on issues that are most um, prevalent with our with our with our with our members in our community. That's great. I'm going to close us out with one question. I think this touches on a few that have come in through the Q and A function around how do we get the public to care? We've talked a lot about small businesses. Small businesses are part of the public, um, but what what's needed to get the public to care about small business? corporate concentration and, and how important small business is to a thriving uh, and equitable uh, economy and community. I personally don't think that it's a matter of caring or not caring. I think everybody that I talk to, you know, cares about this. Like sometimes the language that we use in these spaces can be really exclusive and people don't necessarily know how to engage with it. And also big business is like such, has such a ubiquitous role in our everyday lives. I think people just don't know what to do about it. So I think it's like more a matter of like, you know, how do we build on the organizing work that's happening um, and, and show people that they're are things that you can do about it, that there are wins that are possible, that there are ways to keep, you know, HQ2 out of your community. Um, but I don't think it's that people don't, just don't care. At least that's not my experience. Yeah, I agree. I just echo Brandy. I mean, I think that like one of the things I just said uh, earlier is that, you know, we we are busy, you know, there are folks who I live just outside of DC in Prince George's County. And in the days before, folks would go into the office and then drive, you know, an hour and a half back. And at the end of the day, you're not going to have a complicated conversation about these big things that we get to have the pleasure to kind of have, unpack and think deeply about. Um, so it's it's just like knocking on the door with a neighbor and say, I, I need, I like to spend time to talk to you about this. This has been on my mind. This is why. And it's moving away from the transactional relationships that we've had so long. It's about, I just really want to know you uh, because I think, you know, we have some common interests. And when you can start to have those things, you can really start to kind of make a new narrative because they have the power, they being the, uh, I'm just going to call them I'm just going to call them they because we know who we're talking about. Um, they've been putting like messages out just like a, you know, a Beyonce song that we repeat to ourselves. We believe it. And so now we have to put out a new message. We have to be intentional about that. Yeah, I, I would just add that people are intrinsically collaborative and um, they, have proud, they have pride in their local communities. Uh, it's just a matter of adding an extra layer uh, to reward the right behaviors of the right leaders, right organizations that are doing the work. Um, and I'll give a quick shout out to a group called the Hudson Valley Current in upstate New York. They built a, an actual local currency around small businesses to keep the money flowing inward and they incentivize people to spend locally. So there are all these creative ideas that are popping up throughout the country that are giving, giving people who are already intrinsically proud for the communities yeah. an opportunity to invest locally. And that's what, that's what we should all be focused on. Thank you. That is great, great. Uh, love all of that. Um, I just want to thank our, our panelists, Brandy and Chandra and Assembly Member Ron Kim. Um, I'm going to pass it off to, uh, to Stacey to close us out, but what a rich conversation. Thank you so much. I really want to thank all of our speakers and panelists today. Just an incredible conversation uh, and just appreciate all the work that everyone who is here today is, is doing uh, across the country. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I just want to quick note that we have another um, event upcoming on February 10th. It's really an event about bottom-up strategies that communities can use to strengthen locally owned businesses. So you can find out more about that on our website. And thank you all again for being here today.